What did the Apostle Paul teach about the rapture? When someone speaks about the rapture of the church, they may not realize it, but they are referring to a statement by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, which tells us that believers in Christ who are alive at a certain moment in the future will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The Greek word that Paul used for being caught up to meet the Lord is the word harpazo, which means to seize, to snatch, or to obtain by robbery. This word was translated in ancient times into the Latin Vulgate scriptures as the word rapimer, which comes from the word raptura, from which we get our word rapture. So when anyone talks about the rapture, they're really just speaking about 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Since there are so many different views floating around about when or if this rapture will happen, I suppose it's important that we examine what Paul actually said about it before we make any sure conclusions. Will the rapture take place before the tribulation, or after the tribulation, or in the middle of the tribulation, or halfway through the last half of the tribulation? Well, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul not only teaches us that there will in fact be a catching away rapture, he also gives us several crucial pieces of information about what he means, who will be involved, and even a little bit about when it will happen. So, with that in mind, let's dive into 1 Thessalonians. Since the verse in question here is in chapter 4 of the book, we should begin by considering the first three chapters and recognizing the context in which our verse was written. This book is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church he'd founded in the city of Thessalonica, which was in modern-day Turkey. We can read about how the church began in Acts 17, where we find that when Paul first came to the city, he reasoned with and preached the gospel to the Jews and Greeks of the city, and some of the Jews and a great multitude of very important Greeks believed and became Christians. However, those of the Jewish population of the city who did not believe were angry and responded to this wave of conversion by forming a mob and starting an uproar. They claimed to the authorities in the city that these Christians were rebels because they taught that there was another king besides Caesar, namely Jesus Christ. From this, we may surmise that the teaching of Paul to the Thessalonians during the days or weeks before this uproar occurred must have included his relaying to them the account of the Olivet Discourse of Jesus Christ. Because in that sermon found recorded for us in Matthew 24, Jesus taught his apostles about his future return to claim the kingdom of the world. It's easy to see how a teaching about Christ's future return to set up his kingdom could be misconstrued as treason against the Roman Caesar. And that's exactly the accusation that was leveled against Paul and the Christians by the mob. The book of Acts tells us that this uproar ultimately resulted in Paul's fleeing the city to save his life, and probably within a year after leaving, Paul was writing this letter to the Thessalonians to follow up with them after hearing a good report from his apprentice Timothy about their church. We read in chapter 1 an introduction in which Paul expresses how thankful he is to God for the Christians in the city, saying that they had turned to God from idols and now served the one true God and were waiting for his Son from heaven, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Another indicator of their awareness of end-time prophecy. Paul continued in chapter 2, reminding the church of his faithful service to the Lord while he was with them, and noting that he had suffered much from pagan persecution just like they had. The Thessalonians were apparently still being persecuted by the same factions who had begun the uproar back when Paul had been with them. Then in chapter 3, he wrote that no man should be moved by these afflictions that they were facing, because they knew that they were appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. Here again, Paul reminds the Thessalonians of a truth that he already knew that they knew, because, of course, he was the one who had taught it to them while he was with them. This explains why in his second letter to them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he wrote about the Antichrist, saying, And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. 
Paul didn't write these letters to me or to you. He wrote them to the Thessalonian Christians, and his teaching is based on what he knew that they had already been taught. This passage in 2 Thessalonians also underscores our guess that the church must have been familiar with prophetic teaching about Christ's return and the great persecution by the Antichrist that Jesus said will precede it. If Paul had taught them the words of Christ concerning prophetic events, then it's reasonable for us to assume that he probably would have relayed to them the same teaching that is recorded for us in the Gospel account of Matthew chapter 24. That's where we find the Olivet Discourse. Maybe we haven't shown this conclusively just yet, but hang in there, I think it will become very clear momentarily. Anyway, keeping all of this in mind, we come to chapter 4, where Paul, in verse 13, turned the conversation again to the suffering that they had experienced in Thessalonica, offering words of comfort for those whose loved ones had been put to death. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, he wrote, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, from what we've read in this passage so far, this catching away event could happen at any time on the prophetic timetable. The only view we can rule out so far is the claim that there is no rapture. Clearly, if the word rapture means catching away, then there will be a rapture at some time in the future, because Paul clearly teaches that there will be a catching away. Next, we can also determine from these words who will be included in the rapture. Here, it says the dead in Christ which clearly teaches us that these are those with faith in Christ who had died, and this obviously implies that the we which are alive and remain also refers to believing Christians, since that is who Paul was writing to. In other words, we can conclude that this is not only a real rapture, but also a rapture of all saints, all believers in Christ, both those that are dead at this time and those still alive. I think this seems to obviously include believers who were faithfully waiting for the Messiah in the Old Testament time before Jesus came and died for our sins. Feel free to disagree with me on this, but the text does imply that all of the dead in Christ, a title which means Messiah, are included in this rapture. Then, in the very next verse, which begins chapter 5, Paul anticipated the natural next question that his readers would have concerning this rapture. When will it happen? But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Notice again Paul's statement that the Thessalonians already knew perfectly about the timing of events connected to the rapture, and then he proceeded to quote from the Lord's Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man. Paul quoted him in 1 Thessalonians, saying, But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. In Matthew 24, 43, Jesus compared his coming to a thief who comes suddenly when you least expect it. And Paul wrote, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. In Matthew 24, 38, Jesus said that his coming will be at a time when people of the world are not ready. In fact, they will be like the people that were in the days of Noah, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul said, For when they shall say peace and safety, 
then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Furthermore, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus used the picture of the birth pains of a woman with child as a description of events that lead up to the end times, saying, all these are the beginning of sorrows or birth pains. Jesus here was symbolizing that all the troubling things that will take place between his first and second coming will not be signs of his coming, but will be like pains that a woman feels during her long wait for the delivery of her child. They will continue to happen until the delivery comes. Paul restates these words of Christ by saying, Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And then Jesus concluded his discourse saying in Matthew 24, 42, Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And he continued to give them a parable in chapter 25 about bridesmaids who were sleeping when they should have been watching for the bridegroom to come. Paul says the very same thing in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. There can be no doubt then at this point that the Thessalonian Christians obviously had a foundational knowledge of the doctrine of end-time prophecy, otherwise known as eschatology, and that that knowledge must have come from the teachings of Jesus, specifically the Olivet Discourse, that Paul clearly had taught them. He said, for you yourselves know perfectly, and then he continued to quote the very words of Christ in the Olivet Discourse. So then we've confidently established that in this passage, Paul was explaining the teaching of Jesus that we read in Matthew 24. And since the first part of chapter 5, where Paul quoted Jesus, is connected to the last part of chapter 4 by the conjunction, but, we need to consider the possibility that Paul's statement about a catching away of the saints in chapter 4 was also a rephrasing of words that Christ taught in the Olivet Discourse. In fact, it seems that this is most certainly the case, especially since Paul said, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, before he taught about the rapture. Jesus did mention a catching away in Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41, saying, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Paul wrote that those who are alive at this time will be caught away, using the Greek word harpazo, which means to seize or snatch, and Jesus described it as a woman suddenly taken while she works at the mill, and another taken while working in the field. So then, this means that Jesus also taught about the rapture. He just didn't call it a rapture, and neither did Paul. Paul called it a catching away or snatching, and Jesus called it a taking of people from the earth. We can conclude then that in order to understand Paul thoroughly on this subject, we need to have a comprehensive understanding of the teaching of Christ in the Olivet Discourse, which, as it so happens, is a teaching that Jesus said was based on the book of Daniel. He claimed, whoso readeth, let him understand, meaning that we would need to read the book of Daniel if we hope to understand his teaching. In other words, we need to understand Daniel to understand Jesus in Matthew 24, and we need to understand Jesus in Matthew 24 to understand Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5. They are inextricably linked together, and each prophecy builds upon the previous one. That's why, before I published this video, I first posted three videos walking through and explaining the prophecies of Daniel, and one more long video explaining the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. If you haven't watched those videos, I encourage you to watch them next, because as we've seen, an understanding of those texts is absolutely essential to understand 1 Thessalonians. Now, what can we learn about the rapture from 1 Thessalonians? Well, we already saw that there is certainly a rapture coming at some time in the future, when people will be caught away from the earth. And we also know that the people who will be raptured will be believers in Christ, both living and dead. 
Some have suggested that when Jesus said that two would be in the field, one would be taken and the other left, he was referring to his gathering of unbelieving people to stand before him in judgment. But we have now conclusively demonstrated that this can't be what Jesus meant, since Paul quoted him when he spoke of the catching away of those in Christ. This taking, then, is not the unbelievers being taken for judgment, but is the believers being taken to forever be with the Lord. Furthermore, we can now conclude a few significant things about when this rapture will take place by studying Daniel, Matthew 24, and 1 Thessalonians together. Daniel chapter 9 tells us that there is a seven-year period of time in the future that will count down until the Lord returns in judgment on the world to set up his eternal kingdom. Theologians often refer to this time as the tribulation. Some argue that the rapture spoken of by Jesus and Paul will take place before those seven years begin. This view is called the pre-tribulation rapture. Others argue that it will take place at the end of those seven years. As Jesus is descending to judge the world, they say that he will call up his people to meet him in the air. This is the post-tribulation view of the rapture. Others believe that the rapture will take place at various moments within those seven years, either right before the halfway point of the years, called the mid-tribulation view, or right before the worst of the judgments are poured out on the world, called the pre-wrath view. So which is correct? Well, there's really only one of these views that fits with what Jesus and Paul describe in the two passages we've discussed. In Matthew 24, we learn that the taking away will happen right before a certain time period spoken of by Daniel. Paul called this time period the times and seasons, quoting the words of Jesus about the unknown day and hour. We read that this time period, the day and hour, and the times and seasons, will begin when people are saying peace and safety, and when they are eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, as if nothing in the world was wrong. Then, according to Jesus and according to Paul, people will suddenly be taken from the earth right before a period of destruction that will come upon the rest of the world. Immediately after Paul's claim that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to forever be with the Lord, he wrote that the timing of this is when they say, peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. And in verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul then makes it clear that before the rapture there is peace and safety, and after it there is sudden destruction on the rest of the world. In Matthew 24, Jesus said it this way, As in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the days that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. This teaching is evidently very clear. Believers will be taken out of the earth directly before the beginning of a time period of destruction on the earth that will be preceded by a feeling of peace and safety on the earth. Now, according to Daniel, Jesus, and Paul, in addition to John in the book of Revelation, of course, we know that the last seven years that people call the tribulation will be filled with all kinds of great calamities and disasters. There doesn't appear to be any time within those seven years when anyone will be saying peace and safety. They will all be thrown into turmoil, especially at the beginning and end of this time period when the whole world is at war. This definitely rules out the post-tribulation view of the rapture, and it makes it very difficult to reconcile any of the other views either. Except for one, the pre-tribulation rapture view. The pre-trib view argues that the rapture will take place before the seven-year time period spoken of by Daniel, which is consistent with what Jesus told us. Before that time, according to pre-tribbers, there will in fact be peace and safety on the earth, which fits with both Jesus' teaching and Paul's. And the pre-trib view provides years of time between the rapture of the saints and the midway point in the tribulation. Now, at the midway point, there will be a great abomination of desolation, and Jesus told saints 
at that time to run for the mountains. If the rapture were mid-tribulation, right before this abomination of desolation, then there wouldn't be any saints left to run to the mountains. But if it is pre-tribulation, there would be three and a half years of time for others on the earth to repent to become saints, and they would be the ones fleeing to the wilderness when they see the abomination of desolation. That's why this, along with all of the other reasons I've laid out in this video, brings me to conclude that in 1 Thessalonians, Paul actually confirmed the teaching of Jesus about a pre-tribulation rapture. This seems very evident as we carefully study each prophecy about this subject. In fact, the more I study Daniel, Matthew 24, and 1 and 2 Thessalonians, along with the book of Revelation, the more I can't seem to make any other view of the rapture work at all. What do you think? I know many viewers will agree with me and many will disagree. Either way, let's discuss it as brothers and sisters in Christ in the comments below. Watch for my next video coming out very soon where I hope to discuss what Paul had to say about the abomination of desolation in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You may be wondering why I didn't quote 2 Thessalonians in my argument for the pre-trib rapture in this video, because a lot of other people think that Paul did refer to the rapture in 2 Thessalonians 2-3. However, I don't think Paul mentioned the rapture anywhere in the book of 2 Thessalonians, and I'll explain why in my next video. While you're waiting for that, don't forget to write me a note and let me know what you think in the comments below. Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. And follow The Bible Explained on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Bible Explained. I really do appreciate your support. Also, I want to remind you that the entire Bible is ultimately about one thing, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible teaches that all men are sinners, and that no sinner can have eternal life with God in heaven because we must pay for our sins for eternity separated from God in hell. That's definitely bad news, but the Bible is all about this one thing, the good news that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin on the cross. Since your sin has been paid for by Christ, all that is left for you to do is to accept that gift by faith. If you've never accepted the gift of God by faith, won't you do that today? Leave a comment or send me a message, and I'll be happy to talk to you more about having your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ.